Okay, please welcome Liz Robinson. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Keith, I've always wanted to meet you, so it's been really exciting, um, and you did an amazing job with the graveyard session. However, you are absolutely the hardest person, hardest act in the world to follow. Um, hi, all. I um, I want to. I've been sitting here and I'm absorbing a lot of really great big policy stuff and it's exciting and it's blowing my mind. However, it comes to the point where we need to put it into practice and I want to focus up, but take the register down a little to our practice, how we do some of the important business of local government. And so um, I guess he's perfectly right that we become successful societies by being simply rich. However, how can we as local government make a difference in achieving some of that? So. Um, now, just to get us in the mood, I really want to focus on how we can do a better job of getting it right in engaging our communities in plan making. So that's the focus of the, of the um, presentation. So to get us in the mood, I'd like to pose a couple of questions to begin with. Who's ever organised a community consultation event and was a little bit disappointed at the number of people who turned up? Who's ever wondered why we seem to be consulting with just the same usual suspects? <laughs> it is interesting, isn't it? Who's ever got unexpectedly ambushed by an explosion of community outrage that you didn't see coming? Okay. Who's ever thought, oh, look, I didn't wish I, I know I'm supposed to do a community consultation because it's a statutory requirement, I'm not supposed to do it, but you know, I really know I'm going through the motions, I wish you didn't have to do it, I don't see how that's value to my work. And I'm quite certain it isn't adding value to the community, but I kind of have to do it anyway, and I'm feeling a bit resigned about it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I hear that a lot. And um, who's ever gotten cynical that the practice of community consultation doesn't really be seen to be providing value to you or to the public? Who's ever heard someone in your community say, you know, we are sick of being consulted about strategies and plans when nothing ever seems to happen as a result? <laughs> Who's ever come approached a consultative meeting with a sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach? <laughs> so, then, is there a bit of a mismatch between, here we go, a bit of a mismatch between our practice of engaging with communities and both our own needs and the expectations of communities? So, that's one issue and something that I've observed, and all the hands going up quite actively suggest that there could be something there. And also, I'm hearing a real sense of resignation, a sense that you know, it's just what we have to do and we can't really seem to do anything about it, so maybe we have to soldier on with current models and practices. I don't know whether those things are true or false, but that's the feeling I get as I go around. I, um, just about me, I work as a facilitator. Um, one thing I must say, by the way, is I'm not really, you know, I'm from outside of local government, which makes me feel very honoured to have the chance to speak here. Um, what I do do is I work as a trainer and a facilitator and a, you know, consultant. And I go and meet lots of people in government, so I'm outside of perspective. And I certainly do sense that, that sense of resignation and also um, a sense that things are not quite right, that we need to find a way to do them better. So if we were to flip those negatives into positives, our questions might be, how could we get our practices in sync with the needs and expectations that we have and the needs of our communities? And secondly, if that's the case, how could we go about innovating new models and practices? I'm going to deal with both of these in our talk. And I hope I can fit it in with plenty of time for questions afterwards. So <clears throat> I'm um, doing a bit of work with Wyndham City Council now that I'll report on a little later. And they're looking at really, you know, they have, they have um, got 77,000 more people living in Wyndham City than lived there five years ago, which makes them possibly the fastest growing metropolitan area in Australia. And there's a real sense, there's a real feeling that, that you know, we don't know who these people are. And we need to reach out to them and make some sort of contact. So there's a, there's a feeling of an engagement deficit that we need to fill up. And so um, I was at a little workshop there earlier this week, and the very first thing I said was, okay, let's, um, then I want to go around the room, and I want to ask each of you in the room, and this was with uh, a mixture of council staff and, and citizens, and I said, what was the last thing in your private life that you broke your schedule for, that got you out of the house? And when I read the room, I heard everyone's stories, so and that was really, I've never done it before, so, you know. It was very interesting. What, what, it all came out with all these stories about, you know, it was a friend's wedding, or it was a special chance to attach, catch up with my schoolmates, or it was an amazing event where you got to wear headphones, and it was called a silent concert. 
where you just walk around and, and you pick up music feeds from different Wi-Fi systems or something. And like, so it's very different. But I did it with my friends. And so what came out of it again and again and again with all these stories was that what people break their schedule for, and when you think about it, when we're doing community consultation, it's effectively what we're asking people to do. Break your schedule to come and do something for us or something for the greater good, something you would normally do. So, um, and what they said was to catch up with people we know while enjoying food and drink in an attractive location. That was the feature of almost all of those stories. And the other feature that underlied a significant number of those stories was that it was something meaningful. It was, it was making a contribution. It was making a difference in some way. It was being given an important role that respected me and made me important. And someone, someone said it was about leaving a legacy. I mean, it was amazing. He was being asked to go he went to a community consultation event in his neighbourhood. His reason was, I needed to be able to leave a legacy. And that's that sense of meaningfulness that people are looking for. And if you look at, um, who's ever read Daniel Pink's The Surprising, A Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us? It's a very good book about human nature. It's really one of those really delightful books that tell you a lot and entertain you at the same time. And, and two things that we know that motivate people are purpose and autonomy, which purpose means a reason, a greater reason than us to be motivated. And the second one is where we feel we have a bit of control. So in that case, he thought he was being listened to in that community consultation event. He would exercise a bit of control, and it was for a high purpose, so he went along to it. And several of the people in the room had similar kinds of stories. So the more people feel, that's what science tells, the more people feel they are genuinely contributing to important purposes or decisions, the more engaged they are, the more energy they give, the more they stick with a process for months, rather than just get more quickly. The more they respect the outcome and the more work, the harder they work to protect their legacy. So when people feel they are being given a genuine choice about something, it completely transforms people rela people's relationships with the process. Wouldn't that be something that we want in local government? And so when we think about our practice in local government, one thing that really matters in this whole business of engaging people in you know, plan making is to be able to identify at the very start what is people's level of influence. By asking ourselves this question, what is negotiable and what is not negotiable in this process or this moment? And just to emphasize that, I want to just share a couple of stories that I heard last week in um, a workshop. One was a story about, um, you know, there, this was this is a story from Sydney. There was a, a big new commercial development and a lot of very outraged neighbours. And a councillor said, well, look, you know, I think, I think we need a site, a site conference. So I told these two officers to go, go to the site conference and it was set for a certain day. And they turned up and there were 30 residents there who were all very hit up about a development that they thought was wrong in every way, in, in traffic and overlooking and everything. And so there's the two poor council officers and they're trying to, trying to, they, you know, trying to figure out how to field all these questions to deal with these issues. And it was just about to spin out of control when suddenly the architect turned up in his Porsche. And they were saying, oh, the architect, Mr. Kazak, is here now. He's happy to take your questions. And so <laughs> they were able to deflect the entire issue. But afterwards, I said to them, I said, look, you know, well, what was negotiable? And they said, look, it was a compliant development. It was going to happen. It was actually nothing that was negotiable. I said, well, why were you having a community conference about it if nothing was actually negotiable? What expectations were you creating by doing that? When people come along, they think there must be something negotiable or you wouldn't have the event. I said, have you had any training in doing this? Do you have a protocol to do, to do this about how to handle it? And it was no, no, no. So there's a real deficit that I could see in that situation. The second story was um, uh, a consultation for a massive high-rise enclave in a very small area that's been there for a few years now. And it's very modern, and it's got, well, this is very modern, it's got all these tiny little streets going around. So you've got thousands of people in these tiny little streets. So they've got a big traffic problem, and the council have been struggling with it for a while. And they, um, they had a consultancy, and they went through all the options, and they agreed option four would be the option. And then they said, well, look, we're just right now planning uh, an engagement process. Why don't we engage with the community about the option? And I said, hey, but, but haven't you agreed that's the option? And what's actually negotiable in here? And they went, oh, no, that's the one we're going to do. It's not actually negotiable. I said, well, why are you having a consultation for it? And, um, and, and they actually, they actually turned out they wanted to have a public meeting to sell it to the public. <laughs> What's going to happen in a public meeting? People are going to feel that, you know, it's all cut and dry. Why did you invite me to the public meeting in the first place? They're going to get grumpy. That's not going to turn out very well. So, um, 
there's lots of other ways of sell things rather than having public meetings. So I, but eventually we, we workshopped it a bit, we figured out that what was negotiable was how it would be implemented. So I said, okay, look, why don't you have the public meeting, but instead pose these two questions. Firstly, what do you think our contractors need to be thinking about while they implement this plan? And secondly, how could any risks be managed? Now you're giving real questions to the people in that room. They're able to make a difference, they've got a purpose, they're being respected because their brains are being generally harnessed for a purpose. So now go ahead and have your meeting, but now you can have your meeting and you're not going to be in the same kind of trouble that you were in before. So once again, that question looms, it's, it's kind of, as I do my work, I just, it's just a question that turns out to be a really powerful question when we go to the public. What is negotiable and what is not negotiable? And so often, there is a lack of clarity in the people holding the event themselves. It always marks good engagement practice, a clear understanding of the answer to that question, clearly communicated to all the participants. That means everyone knows why they're here, why they're there. There's no mixed message or fuzzy zone of confusion where conflict can occur. There's no ambiguity. It's that ambiguity that creates conflict down the track. There's clarity about what, where exactly people can make a difference. They know where they stand and we're being honest with people. Look at the other side of it. This is a story I heard a couple of years ago from South East Water. You know, this huge engineering utility. They won the 2010 IAP2 Core Values Award for Best Public Participation Policy Framework. So they got the new policy, so I thought they'd test it out. And they tested it out at a very stinky um, uh, sewage treatment plant at Mount Martha that was going to be upgraded. So they, they, they set up a reference group, and 12 people in the reference group, the mayor, residents, neighbours and environmental opponents. And um, this is what Vivian Gard said, she was their manager of community engagement at the time, and she said, Here's what happened. We, made a, we spent time making it really clear what their level of influence was over the process. It took three meetings. One meeting to discuss terms of reference, one to figure out what was negotiable and create clarity about it, and one more meeting about both those things. Altogether it took 14 months. That was how long it took because we couldn't ask the community reference group to meet more than once a month and time was needed for technical studies. And here's what was interesting. At the conclusion of the process, we organised an information meeting on site for the community. What she was surprised by was that members of the community reference panel started standing up and being the ones who fielded questions from the public, explaining how they had come to these issues as lay people, which means those people had taken ownership of the issue themselves. She said, members of the reference group even wanted their contact details printed on materials sent to the community so they could personally explain decisions to objectives. She concluded, just seeing how positive the result was when we brought people together with clarity about the level of influence they had. Agency staff are often afraid to be clear on what is not negotiable because they're afraid of the reaction. But that vagueness does not work in anyone's favour. So I want to commend that to you as a question to you, for you to ask your people and your managers and your staff before they do any work with the community, what's negotiable and what's not negotiable. So the implications are, one, we'll always get a better result when we do that. What if nothing's negotiable? The answer might be, you know the, you know the IAP2 spectrum, a lot of you will be aware of the inform, consult, involve, collaborate. Just, don't, just do the inform, like be honest about it. This is not negotiable. We're simply going to explain to you out of courtesy what's going to happen here. Everyone knows where they stand if you've done that. You haven't created mixed messages that create conflict. Um, but then the second thing to think about is to match people's engagement method to their likely level of motivation or their attention span. Now I've created a little, a little diagram here to illustrate the idea. And that is, because more things being negotiable motivates people, when we explain it to them, we can predict their level of motivation. If virtually nothing's negotiable, people are going to have a very low motivation. And that translates into their attention span. So where there's not much on not much on the table, we would want to have engagement processes that maybe only lasted one minute. If, a, if there's a couple of negotiables, maybe we would be able to, because people are going to be more motivated, we might push it up to say 10 minutes. If there's actually a fair bit on the plate, we could push it up to a two hour evening meeting, because we know that with those things on the plate, people will be more motivated to give their energy. And if there's lots of stuff to be negotiated, we can have a reference group that might meet for months. So the, the number of negotiables actually gives us guidance about the kind of process to put in place. And if there's virtually nothing to negotiate, 
but a little bit, then that's where things like smart, smartphones become incredibly valuable and a whole new range of possibilities for us. Around 16% of Australian councils do already use smartphone apps or smartphone apps for community engagement. Um, so at the, at the smartphone level, the really low attention span level, and low attention span is also important too because we always have the, the usual customers, but that's actually because a lot of the people we want, want to get in are really, really busy, so it also caters for them. If they can get an email while they're on a the bus with a useful question on it and answer it, we're going to get really high levels of engagement. And this means some good experiments. Deb Gam from the Murudara, where are you? Yeah, we're already experimenting now and finding what's your, what, you're getting 65% levels of response to some of those. Okay, so using that method, we've got a, a panel, two, uh, 500 people on the community panel, we're using a smartphone app to engage them, 65% response rate within 48 hours. So it's certainly, this is an immensely enabling technology for us, and I never thought I would be a technology spruker, but it's actually kind of exciting. Um, here's some nice examples. Neat Streets, it's a, a platform that lets people report potholes and things of nature and then follows them up. Snap, Send, Solve is a similar one. Any of you guys using this? Yeah, cool. Okay, great. Um, My Randwick, this is a, a customised one for one council in Sydney, and then you can report a problem, find and connect to other parts of the website. More than City Council now, this is this, where somewhere we're really using these kinds of things, particularly to report problems. But you can do much more than that. And more than City Council have a Facebook Town Hall app, they call it Town Hall app, where they're able to do things like poll people with questions like, do you support the installation of council-sponsored CCTV cameras in Walnut Street? So that's, a, that's using social media to reach out to a lot more people. Anyone from Orland here? Well, good on you guys anyway. So, because you know, they had to innovate that a lot themselves. And this is a lovely, really nice example from, uh, um, from the United States. It's called Give a Minute, but it's something in New York City. And so, um, and I really do think they showed some of the ways that we could use this. Firstly, they've got a good question, which is, this is in Chicago, oh sorry, Chicago, okay, Chicago. What would encourage you to walk, bike, or take public transport more in Chicago? That is the question. And then, well, what you do is, you've got a, a, a number to call and text your answer in. So how simple is that? And there's ads in various places. So, and, and I think the, um, Gentleman from the Daniel from the U.S. pointed that out that you know it's no point, no point just having these these um, online apps unless you do a lot of back end in terms of inviting people and using traditional media so that people can can um, text in their response they all appear on a website you can also integrate in, 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 interact with it via the internet so how beautiful is that what's good about it is called give a minute give a minute because there is one question that we've identified and then hold people on that question. Here's another one. There's another one from New York City, uh, another online application called All Our Ideas. Um, so like, those are some of the, the methods that are out there, and they deal with that really important and very neglected area of one minute engagement that fills in the gap for people who are really busy, or because we really haven't got anything particularly engaging to discuss with people, because there's not a lot in play. So. Now, just to move on, um, so all this raises some questions for us in local government, which is, how do we do the business of innovating? How do we move into this world? By innovating, I'm going to need to make clear what that means. Innovation is, it doesn't mean we've got to invent a new electronic gizmo that, that's going to take over the world. It, what it means is, it just means something's new to us, or new to a team, or new to an organisation. Innovation is an idea, practice, or technology that's just new to a particular group. A wonderful article appeared just two weeks ago in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. Who subscribes to that? Okay, it's good. It's great. It's great. It's very cool and state of the art thing to subscribe to. And it was good. It was, uh, it was really good. It was um, a, a study by a Harvard Business School, and they, well, they interviewed scores of local governments all around America and interviewed hundreds of people to look at the way local government was innovating. And they said, yes, it is actually looking like local government has some structural barriers to innovation. And one of the structural barriers is that, unlike commercial companies, 
There's no market penalty for maintaining obsolete or ineffective processes or technology in local government. Compared to the market penalty that a manufacturer faces when a competitor brings out a better product and suddenly their customer base disappears. We just don't have that in local government. So a lot of the signals are not coming back to us about things that are not working or could be improved. And it leaves us able to continue outdated processes and technology without suffering a penalty. And the second one, and I don't need to tell you, is the silo structure of government. Silo structure, all great innovations are things that involve mixing and matching ideas from multiple fields, often very unexpected ideas. And when we're in a silo, we're often having a professional discussion in the same language, the same agreed terms, with the same kind of people, and we're not having that wonderful interaction. And I've got a wonderful quote here that, that, um, that for me just captured in one, in two sentences, the, the value of cross-disciplinary interaction. And it's from a book called Resilience by David Eagleman. Anyone been getting into the, any of the literature on resilience? <coughs> very state-of-the-art and cool too, and a very valuable for us in the business of um, working with communities. And the, the quote was, Lab A was headed by a brilliant research site that was trying to solve two labs trying to solve the same problem, two science labs. Lab A was headed by a brilliant research scientist with a, a staff who were all very similar to each other. Lab B had diverse scientists, a chemist, a medical doctor, a geneticist, and so on. Two members of Lab B solved the problem in two minutes at a meeting, while Lab A was working incrementally on a solution two months later. So that is one of the advantages. That's what we get when we mix across disciplines. Anyway, this article in the um, Stanford Review basically said, OK, those are barriers that we face in local government. But there's five ways around it. Firstly, permit managers to carry out low-risk experiments by placing small bets on new ideas. In other words, give permission to people to prototype new ideas on small scales. Rather than building a vast project, do all the planning, build the project, push it into traffic and see whether it drives, which is often the approach that we take, which comes from you know, assumptions that are drawn out of the engineering profession. Rather, very small scale, small bits. And I do think that was a lovely way to think about innovation. Secondly, spend time really paying attention to ways that you could phase out underperforming processes and infrastructure. You can see how in the UK, they have really got to work in this space now. What's that going to make massive change? For example, you might have two systems running simultaneously while a new one proves itself. Thirdly, have tight feedback loops between citizens and public servants. The ability to gauge public reactions and detect frustrations without having to wait till the next election. And that depends on innovation and community engagement. That's exactly what we'll be talking about. Community panels, iPhones, and more interesting ways of doing things. Uh, thirdly, fourthly, recognise and support innovators inside your organisations and reward them, not with money, but by seeing them put their ideas into practice. And lastly, use budget constraints to drive innovation. You can see how that's going to work in the UK. Uh, just got a lovely example here from South East Water. I walked into their cafeteria, and here is the board in the cafeteria. It's called Brainwaves. And it's a board that tracks the implementation of staff initiated innovations in the organisation. And down the bottom are people's ideas, then they get evaluated, then they get some things, possibly developed, and then they become projects, and then they're succeeding in practice. And there's a lot up there in the project level, currently projects in development. What does that say to staff? It says we really value your ideas and your motivation. We're going to support you to create innovations, and we're going to tell the whole world about it because we're proud of it. How does that completely alter staff's feeling of being rewarded and recognised for having their own ideas? I do think that's a wonderful idea. So I want to, um, how we have the time? Sure. Oh boy, okay, I'll be quick. Um, Alright, so I'm doing a little experiment now. Oh cool. Doing a little experiment now with Witham City Council. Now, Witham City is, um, as I mentioned before, growing amazingly fast and recognises there's a big community engagement deficit. And they're doing a few things about it. Um, one of the things is setting up a community of practice, a community of practice of 30 staff from across the organisation. And they're staff from multiple departments, that's the important thing. They're being treated as a group and they're being trained to be the go-to people for community engagement across the organisation. They will continue to be a group and meet regularly and share lessons and inspirations and bring in outside speakers and so on. So the idea of a community of practice of people who do this kind of work, who learn together. 
The second thing is we're currently doing a rapid innovation lab to generate a suite of really in intriguing new ways to interact with residents. Now, um, it's, we, we just finished the, the main day on Monday, and I can't tell you exactly what we've come up with, but it's really exciting. I'll just describe the way the, um, the process works. The process matters, and um, you know, I do think that process is what we've got to get right. Process gives you the outcomes. You just can't say, I want that outcome, and I'll have the process first. So, um, right, so the, this lab is a very rapid thing. Occurs over three mornings. We've got 22 participants. The first thing we did was say, who were the right people? Half are council staff, and they're across many divisions. The second half are members of the public. They're members of the public with skills who we thought could, could contribute. There's a musician, a theatre director, the owner of a local artist, shed and shop, a filmmaker, a businessman involved in Christian outreach, a community gardening activist, a Maori welfare activist, and others. So we brought a lot of interesting people who really care about their community together in one place. And then we did two, we, brought, we just did two mornings with them, two workshops. The first morning, we wanted to bring them up a common level of information about the community. So they're on a local playing field. And um, gave them a detailed briefing on Wyndham population and local social issues. But what was really came out was they didn't understand how council made decisions. And the council staff had to start explaining to them. And they go, oh, really? Is that what happens? And who, does, who makes decisions and how things... It was like a real eye-opener for the citizens. And it, was sort of, it also helped them see, see what it's like to be in local government, too. So it was actually wonderful seeing that discussion occur. And also it was a surprise to the council, to the council staff that the community did not understand the way that they were. And the second really important part, we gave them a mind-boggling slideshow, a little bit like Peter Kenyon's, of inspiring and original engagement ideas from other, other governments all over the world. So that they had, were, feel, were feeling really optimistic and inspired before they did any deliberation. Then we sent them away for the weekend. And then the second workshop was just fantastic. It was um, a whole series of really quite imaginative brainstorms. And what we're doing is we're trying to define events that will engage people and enable people to have conversations once they came together in those events. And it was just, you know, here, here's some pictures of it. It looks very monochromatic. I'm sorry about that, everyone. Melbourne is a monochromatic place. Why? I don't know. Um, but in that room, there is an incredible buzz of conversation ideas of bouncing backwards and forwards. And it was kind of just lovely, exciting. I made everyone draw the pictures, because if you can draw it, it's much more likely to be put into practice than if you write it. When people write abstract language, you can't often it's, it's too comfortable to practice. So drawing pictures, making sense of new ideas, buzzing them all together, ramming them all together, seeing how they fit in different ways, and um, there's some of the pieces of paper that were produced. And what's come out of that in the end are nine proposals, ten proposals for new kinds of ways to engage the public that are actually engaging. And that means they have to be sociable and entertaining and and a chance for people to meet people who they care about, and there's food, and they're in nice places. So it met, met the requirements for something genuinely engaging, but also they're meaningful, because they're, none of them are going to happen unless there is stuff that's negotiable, and I'm just never ceasing to pride the council with identifying what's negotiable and what's not negotiable. That's the starting point for engagement. So that's what some of those um, things look like. The third workshop occurs tomorrow. It's a much smaller event, and its aim is to critically review and make hard decisions about these 10 proposals and decide how to put them into practice. And then the thing I hope follows from that is rapid prototyping, which is an idea drawn from the design profession. And this is, again, this is like the small bets idea. Let's get these things mobilised as quickly as possible out into the community and learn as we go and discover what works and what engages and you know, debug these ideas. So that's what we hope to follow, and that will occur between now and November. That's a, just a, now, what, what, what I talked about then was one way of going about the business of innovating ideas. I think there's a lot of other ways out there as well. And well, one way is to really invite the community to be partners with us in generating those ideas. And it's actually beautiful when it happens. And everyone learns, everyone is enriched by simply spending time in the same room together discussing positive things. So, in summary, from this talk, I want to make, offer three things about improving the way we do community engagement. And that is to ask ourselves three questions. Firstly, before we do any of it, be really, really clear about what is negotiable and what is not negotiable, and honestly communicate that to the community at the start of the process. Secondly, make sure that we are inviting people along to things that they're liable to break their schedules for. 
And uh, one thing we might ask is, would we go if we weren't being paid? If the answer is yes, then probably we'll get a few, get a few people coming along. And then lastly, a much more strategic question, how are we going to go about this task of innovation in local government? Let's try some of these new approaches. Let's, let's permit, let's give permission to our managers to place small bets on new ideas and new ways of going about it. Thank you very much. Questions for Liz? Yep.
Thanks. Do you mind if I just augment that by saying I think that that's a really fantastic idea, is it? Most councillors would agree that we have a problem in um, constantly getting lobbied by the same community members, so the noisy minority, and what we really want to do is engage the silent majority specifically because in New South Wales we're about to embark on a brand new planning system where we need to engage the community as a whole up front to create a local plan. So I'm really interested in this idea. Thank you. Cool, thanks.